We're going to do a quick reflection now on the day, but before, we're going to hear from Johannes, who is a world-renowned expert on scaling up. And so I assume he will have almost nothing to say because nothing new will have been in this room today. However, he might have a few points. Yeah? Okay. Uh, let me stand here because I actually got a few notes here that I yeah, would like to draw on. All right. Uh, first of all, let me say that I will try and keep this short because I know I'm between you and the Cebu bar, and I hope you have beers for beer because I think that's what you need. So get some beer if you want beer later. Uh, it was a fascinating day for me. Um, my, in terms of my objectives, uh, I learned a lot, so I'm a happy camper. And I learned a lot, including about the process of how you organize these meetings. I have to congratulate the moderators. When I listened in on some discussions, yes, planning discussions, I had my doubts, frankly, because it sounded all totally chaotic. But, and I thought, well, this is USAID for you, but then, of course, it turned out perfect. So I think uh, maybe I should say Ila Ilri, but it's a, it's a great model. And I, you know, all the stuff you did, I'd never done before, so uh, including uh, being driven in buses and whatever. So this is great. Uh, congratulations. Uh, for me, and I have a few points, indeed, as you suggested, uh, key question is how do we define success? I think this morning, as I was listening to the cases, um, the examples that we were presented, all of them, by the way, I thought very interesting and extremely well presented, but there seemed to be a lot of focus on the numbers of kilograms, the numbers of hectares, and to some extent the number of people that were reached. But there was very little of anything that I heard about value added, in other words, benefits for the economy, for society, and even in some sense, more surprisingly, what happens to the income of the poor farmers and are we actually lifting them out of poverty? Now, maybe I'm biased here because I spend a lot of time with IFAD and that's what they worry about. And in fact, they try to estimate that as best they can. It's tough, but uh, they try. So I, I sort of throw back at you and I say to you, well, is this really, are you really, in a sense, going back to Soviet times of quantitative output planning? Because that's frankly what it sounded a bit like, and I suspect you don't want that. So uh, give it some thought about whether hectares and, and you know, uh, uh, kilograms are really what you're after, and I, sus I suspect you're not. So that, I thought, was one, one question I would raise. Related to this is a second point, and this is that, again this morning, and actually in, in the in the bus, one of the bus stop uh, uh, exercise I attended, uh, the picture's a bit balanced, but this morning it sounded like, at least these examples, were focused mostly on large and small commercial farmers, with the subsistence smallholder farmers basically being left aside. So the question that I, based on this morning, I would have thrown back at you, so are you basically gonna leave them to their own devices to migrate into the cities or whatever they do? Uh, or do you have a strategy for actually moving subsistence farmers from subsistence to commercial so they can then be picked up and become part of the, uh, part of the value chain programs that you're pursuing? So that to me seems to be an important focus. Now I was happy to see that uh, there was indeed one, uh, I'm trying to remember the name now, but one of the uh, presenters at the bus stop actually apparently has a program working with you specifically on that question, so I'm very happy to see that and I'd like to learn more about it. The third point is that there seems to be a lot of focus on specific crops and specific technologies and we're scaling those up. I assume, and I'm glad to hear you're working on scaling up, but I would ask the question as an economist that I am, so what about the alternatives? Have you thought about whether pursuing some other potential crops, whatever, uh, might not be in fact preferable? In our table that I attended early, uh, earlier today, there was in fact a question asked, well, why not actually focus on, um, on flowers or horticulture? That may be a high value added crop that is actually better value rather than what we seem to be driven by in Feed the Future looking at grains and exclusive, perhaps exclusively grains. I don't know enough about Feed for the Future. But the question of alternatives really should be always asked. Uh, so that's uh, another point I'd make. Innovations, somebody commented today that innovations isn't only about technology, but it's also about processes. And if you remember a little bit from my presentation this morning, what uh, I summarized in terms of IFAT's uh, work in Peru, it was, all pro it was all process. Now, maybe we need to combine those two, and I suspect you do, that in fact, process innovation and technology innovation need to go hand in hand. Uh, fifth point, drivers. Um, 
looking at now, the, much of the rest of my comments are through the lens of, of our little framework. So drivers, I wasn't sure in listening to the discussions whether we always focused on who or how the process of scaling up is actually, who's driving it and how is the driving happening. What, especially what are the incentives for the various actors that are, that are supposed to be participating, public, private, aid agencies. I think you could call it out elements of it but I never thought there was sort of a systematic uh, attention to the drivers in different drivers, including incentives, champions, and so on. On spaces, I was surprised about how little there was on institutions and institutional capacity, partly against the backdrop of you know, the long-standing concern in the development business that we've had about capacity building. That's been the watchword for a long time. So all of a sudden, you guys talk about scaling up, and the capacity that you need to do that, the institutional capacity, seems to have dropped off the horizon. Now, maybe wrong, and it's just a different context that you discuss this. But I, I think you might want to reflect on this. I thought it was, was fascinating that ATA is, in fact, an institutional mechanism, innovative institutional mechanism, transitory, very important, by the way, that's supposed to phase out eventually. And there's probably stuff we can learn from that particular mechanism, and I hope that this will be factoring into your consideration down the road. Very little I heard about financial and fiscal space. Uh, there, there was sort of, at one point, a bit of a concern, well, where's the budget going to come from to continue doing this stuff? And I think that's exactly the right question, or at least part of the question. If, whenever I hear that donors finance something by grants, I get worried about sustainability and scalability, because what happens when you guys leave? Who's providing those financial resources? Unless you have a strategy, an explicit strategy, as part of your scaling up plan and pathway that says we're going to reduce costs, we're going to get the government to commit continued budget, an increasing budget over time, and freeing up those resources from somewhere else, uh, uh, or we uh, introduce cost recovery. So where are those ideas? Where are those questions? Make sure they're being asked. Indeed, I, uh, from my experience with all the other donors that I've worked with on scaling up, for sustainability and especially for uh, scalability, the question of financing after the donor leaves is hardly ever addressed, and it's really an issue that I think you need to deal with. Partnerships, I think everybody recognized they're very important. Uh, there was sort of a concern that they can be costly, and I, I believe, indeed, co coordination experience has been that it is costly, especially when it's top-down. When we meet once a month on, you know, the all the agriculture people get together to just discuss and coordinate. What I think we, you need to focus on, and actually the tool that Maria presented in terms of her partnership uh, mapping and so on is a good one because it focuses on the bottom-up question. Who, where are the partners that we want to work with us, that we want to work with, that are potentially effective? And so it's really the bottom-up question that should be asked, where are the partners, rather than top-down, uh, ordering everybody to coordinate for coordination's sake, which frankly, in my experience, doesn't work well. Policy space. Nigeria was a fascinating case. You may have heard something like 100% something or other protection for rice. Now, do you really want to build up a rice industry in a country that is 100% sort of Japan-like, 100% forever? Or what is the trajectory on that protection level? So, as you think forward, you better have a a, 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 some assumptions made about what happens to the protection level. Will it stay? Will it be phased out? And what does that mean for the rice farmers and the rice value chain over time? Where are the, the, the cost reductions, where are the profits going to come from as over time? Perhaps in one way or another, this protect, protection will have to be, I would submit, not uh, be maintained forever. Cultural social space uh, was mentioned and I think is worth uh, remembering as important factors. One final comment on value chains, very little was said on infrastructure. Again, getting back to our, our work with IFAT, infrastructure seems to be, in many cases, uh, one of the problems that is related to access by the poor farmers, especially in remote regions, and who's going to finance the infrastructure? It always, almost always requires some general tax financing, budget financing. You put in some grants for a little bit of infrastructure, but you leave, the infrastructure goes away because nobody maintains it. So you have to think about about that. All right. Last point. Uh, I thought the CBA cost-benefit analysis 
The presentation was fascinating, extremely well done, and I congratulate you for that very good presentation. I thought it was very thought-provoking. bit background, I used to work a lot on cost-benefit analysis in my early days at the World Bank. The World Bank, in my experience, has actually dropped cost-benefit analysis almost entirely from its effective project preparation uh, toolkit, displaced by a lot of other stuff that project officers now need to do. I was fascinated to hear that USID is reversing that trend internally, that you're actually building up the capacity. And I, I, you know, I, to me, the question is then, given fixed budgets, what has to give? What, what are you going to do less of as you build this up? Now, maybe your budgets are increasing, but uh, I wouldn't count on it. So there is that question in the back of my mind, as you now build up uh, cost-benefit analysis, you know, there, there's no free lunch. So some, something will have to give. Now, maybe it's just all specifically local, locally done, but uh, it's worth at least thinking about. Um, I thought the point that was made that cost-benefit analysis is a good tool to focus on many of the issues that we need to focus on and do it so as quantitatively and systematically as we can in, scale, in thinking through scaling up was well taken. And I had not thought this through myself, so I've learned on this one especially, I learned a lot. Um, and so I, you know, I think a, no, a number of the points I mentioned in my sort of as dogs that didn't bark in our discussion actually would be picked up if you do systematic cost-benefit analysis. Um, I have a number of questions about it. Uh, the resource question, what are you going to give up if you do more of it? I don't know. More importantly, make sure as you do the cost-benefit analysis, it doesn't reinforce, reinforce your exclusive focus on the project. Okay, this project has a positive cost-benefit return uh, or a positive return. Think about it in the broader context of what it means that this project is a stepping stone to some, something further along. You could have a project that actually has, an, let's say, a negative rate of return, but it is actually the entry point, the entry step to a second project that you, with some confidence, project to be actually then turning a profit because you've taken this first step. I, I'm not sure I have a good example for it right now, but that's conceivably possible. So, and of course, there are things like institutional capacity and so on that are not easily captured in cost-benefit analysis. So, it's one tool. I have to think more about how this tool could be effectively used for the scaling up analysis. And I'm very grateful to uh, Mr. Swift, to uh, uh, forget your first name, I apologize, for bringing it to us today. Because I thought, to me anyway, it was one of the most important learning uh, takeaways of, of the day. Thank you very much. I hope that wasn't too much. Thanks, Johannes. I think Dan had to go and pick up a new car. So he's going to be here tomorrow, though. Julie, are you, oh, you're hiding over there, yeah. Can you do a similar? Shorter, okay. <laughs> yes. No, I just had a couple of points, because I, I actually agree with, with much of what Johannes said. Um, I do want to start out by saying that I have just felt the energy grow and grow, um, sort of counterintuitively, that every time a session started, uh, we, we left with more energy than we came in with. So that's, that's most unusual, you know, in most conferences and workshops that I attend. So I thank all of you who must be exhausted, those of you who waited in a, a customs visa line for three hours, but thank you for that, um, and we'll try and keep it going. Um, I want to make one point about the cost-benefit analysis. I also thought that that session was riveting. Um, but when I put my USAID hat on, you know, I'm thinking, my gosh, it's really important that we brought it back into the agency, but, but we really have to figure out what are some quick and dirtier, quicker and dirtier ways of doing you know, benchmark sorts of, sorts of analyses rather than full-blown three-month you know, must hire a consultant because what that does you know, by, by setting a higher standard for our cost-benefit analysis, I think it was important in this first stage to establish this is credible, this is important, but now, you know, kind of back off and say, well, you know, let's do a first stage analysis so that, that allows us to uh, assess a greater number of options. When we don't do that, you know, it sort of forces us down to this is such a, a long and painful process. Let's just choose one and then do the cost benefit analysis on that. So I think that's, that's something I'm going back with, you know, I, and, and really thank the panel here because I, it just really set off a bunch of... Uh, of reactions to me that we, we need to figure out how to do this in, in, a, in, a, in a less uh, 
time and resource intensive way. And so, can you, uh, I'm really looking forward to your presentation tomorrow because, you know, my, my hunch is, you know, that the private sector probably has a lot of those quicker and dirtier tools that, you know, you might uh, talk to us about, you know. So how do you make it a choice, you know, that, you know, of these 10, 10 directions where you could go, how do you sort of quickly assess, well, it's these three that we focus on. Anyway, so that was, that was one big learning for me today. Um, I, I agree on the, the case studies that were presented, really, really fascinating, and they just brought home that what we're talking about are really clusters of technologies and institutional innovations. Um, very rarely, you know, do you, there's no silver bullet idea. You know, it's really pulling all these things together. In few cases do we have one partner sort of controlling the whole vertical process. So scaling up by definition is pulling together different kinds of partners. Now, you know, one scary thing is I think in Feed the Future, and the new alliance, you know, we've essentially had this mandate, you know, from the G8, from uh, African heads of state, okay, pull all the partners together. And it is so hard. It is, it is so hard. So, you know, this looming question of if it takes coordination uh, to do scaling, um, it's hard to do it voluntary, in a voluntary way. Private sector does it because somebody has skin in the game at every, in every piece. So, so what, what are the insights that, that we can take back to, to the missions on, on this, on, on coordination? So um, lastly, lastly, yes. Um, we have talked a lot today about kind of the long-term nature of scaling. You know, but I, I insist, I insist again, you know, in very few cases are we ever starting at zero, right? I mean, we get a lot of pushback all the time. Of, you know, why are you guys expecting us to have impacts within one year? within six months, within two years. But, you know, really all that we're doing today, I can't think of anything that was discussed today, you know, that I haven't had some knowledge of somewhere in the past, you know, started 10, 15 years ago. You know, Luis's uh, presentation, what was happening in Mozambique, that's at least 10 years old. So, so we're always building on a whole range of investments, you know, usually involving public, private, NGOs. My question is, at what point in that process, you know, do we stop and ask ourselves, well, now, when do we get more purposeful about scaling, about analyzing what it's really going to take? Because I feel like we're not, we're not doing that, you know, so that's, that's a question that I'm, I'm hoping we can return to tomorrow. But thanks to all of you, and thanks to our terrific uh, team of moderators uh, for, for a really exciting day, and I'm really looking forward to tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Johannes. Okay, we're, gonna, we're nearly there. I believe Ed's going to come up in a couple of, couple of minutes, Ed. We're going to look at your evaluation. You're doing this evaluation exercise, I believe. But before you do that, just a second. Does anybody have, we've just had two learning, 12. How many did you have, Johannes? Learning points. Six. Julie had three or four, right? So anybody in the room have a learning point you want to share from the day that you say, wow, that was a fabulous insight? Well, that was a totally boring, dull thing I knew already. Anybody want to share something? Wow. Okay. Nothing to share. Great. Emmy, you've been part of this preparation of the whole day. Do you want to share something? Fabulous. Yeah, I just want to say, in response to Johannes' thing about, about chaos, that there is always a lot of not only energy, but a lot of ideas and interchange that come out of that, that interactivity. And I know a lot of you sort of arrived last night, as Julie said, and are tired. But tomorrow, again, we have a number of opportunities planned for interaction. And, it's, and that, to me, is going to be that kind of takeaway. If you come up, you know, if we just asked you now if you had any learning points for today. And everybody's going, oh, God, no. But tomorrow, if you kind of think of something and say, you know, I thought about that overnight while I was, you know, jet lagged at 2.30. I really think we should talk more about, uh, or I really want to react to a point that somebody made. Tomorrow, just grab one of the three of us and say, you know, look, put this down. We want, we want this recorded, you know, for the minutes for the meeting, because I really think it would be helpful to have that. So if you've got any learning points that occur to you tonight or reactions that you have, just, just feel free, okay? Talk. We do start tomorrow with three designated listeners who have been listening closely as opposed to everybody else who's listening 
non closely. Uh, you have a comment? Hi, thanks. I just wanted to make a quick comment. Um, the client, related to the decision support um, panel that we had today, the Climate Smart Agriculture people in um, Washington, which is an interagency group composed of folks from USAID and State Department and other places. Um, they prepared a two-page document that they wanted me to share with you guys, and so that is out on the table there. And the Climate Smart Egg Group works on both um, resilience and adaptation of crops to climate change and mitigation for climate change and environmental impacts. And so they're very interested in how the scaling efforts that we're all talking about in, uh, relate to both of those components. And so they put together this two-pager, and it's out on the table. And on the two-pager, there's um, lists of contacts, and they're very interested in um, talking on the phone or emailing with people who would like to discuss ideas related to um, environmental impacts of scaling. Thanks. That's more of an advert, it sounds like, right? A commercial for the Climate Smart Hike people. Good. Ed, over to you. Uh, earlier in the day, we uh, said that one of the things we wanted to do was to check in with you regularly over the course of the uh, the uh, two and a half, three days. And the way that we began to do that was to ask you what questions, what issues you came in the door with. And remember when we did that earlier today? You want to pull that one out with the big, uh, what used to be a blank box on it, and hopefully now has a few questions or issues or things that you wanted to get out of the, the time here, this, this, uh, this two and a half days. If you could pull that out of your folder. Turn to the second page, which says Tuesday, right at the top. Is that working? Good. We would like you to reflect on the three questions here. And the, the reason is um, we will want to take a look at these and uh, get a better idea of what it is that, uh, that happened today and what we need to pay attention to tomorrow. So what I'd like you to do, three questions. What insights did you come up with today? Not maybe the ones that you wanted to put out uh, when Emmy and uh, Peter asked, but the insights that you got today. Continuing issues or questions that you're hoping are addressed in the remainder of the time. And then takeaways, things that you're going to want to take back to your mission or your organization. When you get done doing that, if you could take the Tuesday page and tear it out. Just take the Tuesday page, put it up here, keep the rest. Keep the first page, keep Wednesday and Thursday because we're going to come back to those obviously on, on uh, Wednesday and Thursday. But if you could pull that second page out, jot down your thoughts on those three questions, put them on this chair up here, we'll see you tomorrow morning. Okay, thank you for a really good day.